Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to introduce moderator Marcy DePino, who will engage today's panel in a conversation on environmental justice in our local arts community. Please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom if you're joining us via Zoom, and in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook. To kick off today's discussion, I would like to share a work by one of today's panelists, Kevin B. Sampson. Next slide, please. This work is titled The Majet, which refers to ancient Egyptian mythology and the role of artists in Newark's contemporary history. Using materials found on Newark streets, Kevin Sampson transforms these materials into vivid sculptures. But beyond art, he's an avid supporter of Newark and the artist community, consistently speaking out against all forms of systemic injustices. Next slide, please. Today we have Marcy DePina. Marcy DePina's passion for the arts and activism has been the anchor for her career using art as a vehicle for positive change. After creating Forza Media Group LLC in 2005, Ms. DePina honed her expertise in the areas of event and multimedia production, DJing, public relations, marketing, and social media. In 2014, Ms. DePina was named Executive Director for Newark Riverfront Revival a nonprofit, or nonprofit organization that programs Riverfront Park and advocates for riverfront development and public access. In this role, she developed an innovative approach to curate events that bring together dynamic cultural expressions with diverse audiences to reconnect people with the historically abused and neglected waterway. Today, she continues to use her voice, talents, and network to help raise the frequency of our world through the arts and provide a platform for for voices and conversations that elevate. And with that, I hand it over to Marcy. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Newark Museum of Art for hosting this round table today. I'm so excited to be able to be here to present this really important discussion around Newark Riverfront Park and Newark Riverfront. Uh, for many years, as Mohammed talked about, the um, historic Passaic River has been cut off from the people of Newark due to years of abuse and neglect. Um, the Newark Riverfront and the Riverfront Park project was really something that was born out of decades, decades of struggle by people in the community. It started out really, it's an interesting story for me. Um, you can look at the all of the abuse that's happened along the Passaic as a tragedy, and indeed it is. Um, from everything from the smelting plants to uh, you know people dumping their garbage in the river and so much other abuse but really the big biggest tra tragedy that happened was the diamond, diamond alkali company that used to produce agent orange and was actually dumping that into the river so between that and all the paint companies the passaic river was really something that was abused but it was the founding point of newark as we know it today the city that we know today that we all love and so it's really been an important, not only cultural element of the city, but economically and civically, and of course, for transportation. So the tragedy that happened has really been turned into a triumph, um, really because of the community, because the people and the great resilience of the people of the city of Newark to continue to fight for public space, for access to the river, which we call blue space, and you know, really to be able to access our natural rights, which is to enjoy an environment that's clean, that's safe. So this park story is, is really about a park that I like to call the people's park. So after decades of struggle, River Bank Park, which is just across the street from River Front Park, was gonna be demolished to make the North Bear Stadium. And you know, the people in the Ironbound, Ironbound Community Corp, and a lot of other organizations had been fighting for years against the pollution that really beats up our city, and particularly the Ironbound Down Neck. And so, you know, over the course of those years, this park that was going to be demolished was really sort of the final straw. Um, we already have a lack of green space in the city. We have a lack of tree coverage in the city, well below the national average. And so this was the final straw. So the community, the entire community galvanized and got together, formed an organization called SPARK with people like Nancy Zach and Lenny Thomas 
and um, so many others in the neighborhood that really got together to fight and to stand up and say, we are not gonna have this public space taken from us. And we want this river cleaned up once and for all, we want this land remediated. So that fight ended up, they actually ended up winning. And for everybody out there that thinks that your voice doesn't matter, this is a beautiful story that happened right in our city that shows you that the power of the people is real. That when people get together and they share their resources and they come together as a collective, we can really achieve great things. So that's the story of Newark Riverfront Park. That fight ended up saving Riverbank Park, which actually turned into the, um, pro the, the process really turned into us having to build Riverfront Park because there's a law in New Jersey that says that if you take away public space, you have to replace it. So because Riverbank was set to be demolished and turned into the Newark Bears Stadium, these plans for Riverfront Park were already set in motion. So we actually, it was a huge win. We saved Riverbank Park and we also were able to bring in a new park, which is Riverfront Park, giving people access to the river that they hadn't had for decades. So this, as I said, is a triumphant story and it wouldn't have happened without the people. And art was something that played a great, great role in this. From the inception of the park's design with the landscape architects, Weintraub Diaz and people like Damon Rich and Trust for Public Land and all the folks at Ironbound Community Corp and the people who had formed a new organization called the Friends of Riverfront Park. There was a community engagement process in which children that lived in the neighborhood and lived in the city got together and put out what their ideas and their plans and vision for this park would be. And as a result, we have a beautiful park that will ultimately, ultimately be three miles long and will encompass the full length of Newark's riverfront, giving people access to the river for the first time, as I said, in decades. And again, art was really important. In terms of the design elements, I wanna show you guys some slides. So if we could have the first slide, first slide, please. So this is what the park looked like before and after. And as you can see, it's a radical transformation of the space. If you were familiar with Newark's riverfront prior to this park being here, you knew it was a pretty wild scene. Um, it was, you know, just a ton of garbage. There were, um, trailer the trailer uh, containers were stacked up really high you couldn't even see the river people were living on the river um, it just wasn't a it wasn't a nice place to go and you certainly didn't recognize that there was a river there in fact a lot of people when we asked them did you know that there was a there's a river in Newark they're like really and you have to remind people that that's what you drive over when you go over 280 or when you're along route 21 or when you're taking the train to New York um, so this is the kind of transformation that happened. And um, as you can see, we took a space that it was a really a blight of the community and made it into a beautiful, beautiful amenity for our community. So can I have the next slide, please? So some of the design features that are in the park that I wanna note, this is one of the ways in which art played an important role in the creation of this park, but was also used as a way to teach people about the story of the Passaic, of the story of Newark's riverfront. So if you see there on the left side in the upper left corner, there are these large six orange sticks. They are one of the markers and the identifiers of this park. They're absolutely beautiful. They've turned out to be an art installation, but they really started from function. So they were piles that were driven into the park to help stabilize. This entire park has been remediated. So it was a big process to have to remediate all of the soil and make it safe for people to actually be able to access this park. So those um, giant orange sticks were part of that process in building the park. But when people looked up and they saw them, they thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Let's keep those there. So they've become an iconic uh, marker for the park. And that's one of the ways in which art was brought into the landscape architecture. So you see in the next um, two top photos, you see that along the, the park's railing, we have these metal, um, these metal stories that tell, I'm sorry, these metal uh, carvings that tell the story of the riverfront. So there's things all along there about the combined sewer overflow, but it's not, and not just the sewer overflow, but really about the entire story that I just went over with you. So it's not just a, 
you know, an, a, an educational uh, tool. These are actually an art feature. So if you're a, a kid or an adult, you could take a piece of, piece of paper and put that on there and then just go over it with a crayon or with um, a pencil and you can actually transfer that image onto your piece of paper. So it was designed to be an interactive uh, element that would be fun for kids and would help to be a, a way in which to teach people and get excited about what happened along the Passaic. Similarly, on the bottom left corner, there's another plaque and there, there are four of those in the um, Orange Sticks area of the park, which continue to tell the story, beginning with the Lenape people, which were the indigenous people of our area. And so from there, all the way through to the present, including the fight for the park was told with these elements, which are now actually on these giant logs. So another way to uh, have the design element in there, but also to educate. And of course, on the bottom right hand side is our lovely park map. And it doesn't just have the current park, it has the vision for the entire park, which is all the way into the northward, which would extend throughout the full length of the city's riverfront. So can I have the next slide, please? Uh, these are just a couple of photos to the left. Those are the folks from Newark, Newark's um, River Friends of Riverfront Park group. Um, as I mentioned, this was not an easy this was not an easy feat to get this park built. It has taken a lot of money. It has taken a lot of effort and a lot of great partnership. And it would not have been possible without the Friends of Riverfront Park. And I see there in that photo, I want to um, just mention um, that we also have. Um, Drew, Drew Curtis is in there from Ironbound Community Corp. We have the Seidlers who own a company that is based, um, on, well, they actually have recently sold the company, but have owned this company for generations, a chemical, a responsible chemical company that's uh, on Brill Street and that actually allowed us to use the side of their building for a mural project that was um, instituted by our great friend, um, and who we miss so dearly, Rodney Gilbert. And that was the City Murals Project, which we'll hear a little bit more from Kevin Sampson on that project. Um, and in addition to that, we have our folks from Terrell Homes, which is the housing project that is nestled just at the end of the park, which also played a great role in getting this park built. And it was important for us that this park was something that was for all people, not just for residents of the Ironbound. You know, there's been a historical divide between our city and the Ironbound um, from, from the tracks. We all know, uh, if you live in the city, you know about that. Um, and this park is, is not an Ironbound park. This is a Newark park. This is a park for all people. One of the other design features that's there on the right photo is um, a poem that's there that's etched into the um, the welcome in the orange sticks area. So I encourage you if you have never visited Newark Riverfront Park to come to the park and check out these great elements that bring together the art that's actually in the park that's part of the actual design of the park and discover a little bit of the history of the real struggle and the hard work, the blood, sweat, tears, you know, the human equity that went into building this park, which we'll hear a little bit more about with Maria from the Ironbound Community Corporation. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned, uh, we do have this historical divide in our city, and it's something that this park has really been very uh, mindful and conscious of and has worked very hard to bring folks together. And one of the ways that we've done that is through the art. It's been the art. It's been about coming up with innovative programming that brings people down to the park. So to the left there, we have Rodney Gilbert, who led our very first uh, walk to the water. The walk to the water has been something that we've done every year, which starts at City Hall, goes throughout the downtown, and marches to Riverfront Park to really make a statement that the river belongs to the people this is your park public space is just that it's public in the middle we have the bomberos which is a portuguese uh drumming group um they're called the roxinhos i believe is the name of this group um and the grupo the bombas and that was bringing in the portuguese element we've been very intentional in being multicultural in the approach here so we include Nork has a great 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 diversity of various 
populations of people from all around the world. And it's been, especially since, since I've been on board, it's been really important to me to be inclusive of all of those folks. And to also bring people from outside of Newark, not just to focus on promoting our culture here, but to draw people in by collaborating with people from other areas, New York City through other parts of New Jersey to really create that type of cross-cultural exchange. To the right, we have, I believe, I can't see the full photo, but I believe Nancy Zach is in that photo. And that's some of the tours that we do, which brings people along the more wild parts of the riverfront that haven't been developed into the park yet. And if you haven't been down there, I encourage you to check it out because there's an incredible graffiti artwork that's there uh, that has been historically, since graffiti has been around, an important place for people to mark their tag. And Jerry Gant, uh, also rest in peace, used to lead those tours for us as well. Um, so those are some of the other ways in which we would expose people to the riverfront. And to the left, you see our movie nights, which would bring together families. Um, to the right, you have some drummers uh, underneath the orange sticks. But I have to just quickly mention our house music nights, because our house music nights have been one of the most important events that we've had that have brought people from all around the city, people as far as Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New York City, to come to our park. Newark is known for its house music. House music is one of our great loves. And being able to have this type of event, we've drawn between 2,000 and 3,000 people to the riverfront. People that never felt comfortable coming down neck to party came down and we all gathered together in peaceful, beautiful music, dancing with Omar Abdallah and guest DJs. So the programming has been incredibly important, performing arts, everything from live poetry, music events, dance, theater, um, we've had a lot of live painting, just a lot of different ways in addition to our athletic programming with, um, we've had a race every year with Purpose Runners Group, um, yoga, Zumba, different um, kayaking, and of course getting people on the river with the kayaking and also the real cornerstone of our program has been our riverfront boat tours. So those are just some of the ways in which we've used art, the performance arts in particular, to really draw people to the park. And can I have the next slide, please, which I think just shows a little bit more about that. Right there you have up in the up left, upper left-hand corner, you have, that's from our dance event uh, to Newark-based Brazilian hip hop artists uh, who came out and did a phenomenal job. Every year we've partnered with um, an organization, Dance on the Lawn, that's based in Montclair, and they've uh, provided us with one featured dancer and all the other dancers we really try to draw from the area. To the right is just a scene from our house music, just to give you a little taste of how many people really come out for that. It's incredible to see so many people come out and enjoy themselves. And down at the bottom was a mural that we uh, did last year that we dedicated to Jerry Gant. If you know Jerry's work, Detox the Ghetto, Detox Your Mind, Detox Your Heart, was really important. And Jerry was a dear friend of mine. Uh, who was part of our hip hop day from the beginning and really played a great role in the park uh, in getting people to come to the park as well. And so we dedicated that mural to him, Detox the River. We thought it was an appropriate sort of, um, you know, riff on Jerry's ideas. If one thing needs to be, you know, detox down at the park, it is absolutely the river because one thing that I have to mention is that the river is still not clean. It's very important that we understand that through all of this fight, we have a great park, it's beautiful, but the river is still not cleaned. It is a Superfund site. It is one of the worst Superfund sites in our country that's in our neighborhood. It's very important that people understand this. And this is why art is so important because art helps to get that messaging out. People might not know. I lived right next to that river for a very long time and had no idea about the tragedy that had happened. I had no idea. You know, you know sometimes, oh, this smells or that, you know, but you don't really know. And you have to dig to get the information unless you're intimately involved and acquainted with. So this, this role working um, with Newark Riverfront Revival for me personally has been a great blessing because to understand what's really happening in our community and to be able to advocate using you know the talents that I have to be able to use programming to be able to use art to really give people the story I think is an incredible an incredible way to be able to to work so I'm very grateful for that and uh, I think there's one more slide 
and it might be my last slide. Yep, that's my last slide. So thank you very much. I'm really excited to bring these these panelists um, and to have this panel. Thank you, Newark Museum, for for hosting this. Uh, we have with us um, four people who have been important in not only this sharing this story and being part of the storytelling, but bringing their artistic talents to the table and sharing them in such a way. We have Maria Lopez Nunes, who is the uh, director of environmental justice and I believe community organization um, at Ironbound Community Corp who will talk a little bit about the role in which art has played in advocating and fighting for economic justice and um, I, I think we're just interviewing people just one one on one right yes okay so Maria welcome hey thank you thank you uh, Marcy, for all all the work you do on River from Revival, you know, and I'm grateful for the New York Museum to, for putting this on today. Um, before I start, I guess I, I would want to welcome folks into environmental justice. You know, I, I always try to bring visibility to the fact that I I know I, growing up for me, and I grew up, you know, I'm not from the work. I grew up in Bushwick before it was gentrified. So I, I, when I moved to Newark, I thought that, that you know, I was, I was going to a safe place where gentrification was not gonna happen, but it's after us all. Um, and I know that when I saw the environmental movement, I didn't think that that was something for folks like me or that came from where I come from. You know, it seemed like a very white tree hugging sort of thing. So I, I try to be an ambassador for the fact that there is an environmental justice movement, a climate justice movement that is for people of color, it is by people of color, right? It is led by black and indigenous people, Latinx people, um, because in the United States, we can make, we could put maps and we could see where the concentration of black and brown people are and where the concentration of pollution is. And those maps will often overlay, especially in the state of New Jersey. Those maps are almost a direct correlation. And I think the river, like Marcy was saying, it's a great example of that. It is the longest Superfund site in the country. And it's 17 miles of a Superfund site. And the reason for that is, I know you mentioned the dioxin factory, di uh, um, diamond alkali factory. That's where during the Vietnam War, it was the largest producer of Agent Orange in the country. You know, so when while we were bombing folks in Vietnam and dropping uh, Agent Orange to like make all the leaves fall off of plants, we were making it right here in Newark. And that company was actually dumping the byproduct dioxin, which is the most toxic, cancer causing stuff to, to humans, they were dumping it into our river and the powder was getting picked up and was all over, um, spread, was spread through the neighborhood of the iron bomb. So I think it's always important to honor that whenever we talk about the river and the fact that when, when you try to poison others, you're poisoning yourselves. And in this country, disposable people are the black and brown people, the poor people of the United States. Um, so, you know, you talked about River Bank Park and Ms. Nancy Zach, um, always holding us true to custom, um, was uh, reminded me that we always have to honor the, the fight of River Bank Park and how art was used to preserve River Bank Park. So while River Bank Park was threatened to be demolished in order to build Bear Stadium, they kept the park alive by asking all the elementary schools and different artists from the city of Newark to just put up big um, murals, you know, to like send these big, uh, you know, plywood things so that the, the community would not forget that the park is there. And when we think about the city of Newark and the effects of climate change, we need to preserve our parks. And I think we need to engage with them. They're not just static, you know, pieces of grass that we go and sit sometimes. I think the, what's been beautiful about River Farm Park is like Marcy was saying, all the elements to like both learn history learn how to get become civically engaged and how can you can you can live with the park you know how do we return our relationships back um back to the water back to land so that we can co coexist with the nature that's around us that often it protects us right like as we're seeing all these storms coming up our way um river Fun park made a difference the fact that instead of it being concrete, it was open space, it absorbed water. And we know we've seen so many issues with flooding in our city, we need more parks to be able to absorb water. And I think that bringing arts and bringing community organizations together um, so that there's not a disconnect there is super important. And that's the work that Riverfront Revival has been doing, you know, because 
um, I think I'll leave it there, you know, just in terms of the history, the arts have always played a history. You know, you could see in my background, anytime we march, you need, you need the art to march. <laughs> Otherwise you're just a bunch of people in the street, you know, like right now we're fighting um, for some rent relief for people during COVID and art has been driving driving those campaigns, you know? So I think, how do we get art to be responsive to community organizing so that it can work hand in hand um, and we can build more community par power, you know? I'll leave it there. Great, thank you so much, Maria. Um, the work that Ironbound Community Corp does is incredibly important for our community. Um, you know, tireless advocate, 50 years of activism, and really, it's not just about the ironbound. Yes, the ironbound does have the, you know, have the bulk of the pollution, but the pollution that happens in the city of Newark affects the entire city. And Ironbound Community Corp may be based in the ironbound, but certainly the work that ICC does is for the entire Newark community. So thank you so much for um, explaining a little bit more about the environmental perspective of things. Uh, next slide, please. Great. That's some of the work that um, Maria was talking about there. Spark, we would be, we, we have to have, Spark is a huge part of the conversation. You know, people like Nancy Zach, Nancy's name is gonna keep coming up because the work that she has done and the, um, just the contribution has been huge. This, if you see there in the bottom left-hand corner, that's 1999, just to put things in perspective. And that this work has been happening for much longer than that. And next slide, please. Ann Street School, the Hawkins Street School, Hyatt Court. You know, these are important uh, spaces in the Ironbound that bring together our youth and that really give our kids an opportunity to understand where they live, but not just understand where they live, but how they can be advocates very early on. Because if they're not engaged, uh, they just, as children, it becomes harder as you become an adult. When you know what's going on as a kid, you know, you really, that. It's built into your, it gets built into your DNA. Next slide, please. Beautiful. And next slide. That's all of the schools that are in the iron bound there. These are all of the schools that participate in this River Bank Park mural project that's been happening at least since 1999, as we saw there, but I'm pretty sure it's been happening for longer than that. Next slide, please and more of the children. The youth have really been important. If you look there in that left-hand corner, you see some of um, some of the, the EJ storytellers. So that's Elizabeth McGrady, Ruby Hamilton from Terrell, and Lenny Thomas, who is uh, one of the strongest advocates in our community and also helped to run our summer camp at Riverfront Park. Next slide, please. Great. So up next, I'm really excited. Uh, this was, I think, two, almost three years ago when this project was first uh, brought to my attention from the Newest Americans Project, which is a project that's based out of Rutgers University. Um, we started talking about the riverfront and the importance of the riverfront and, and all of the, everything that we're talking about right now, um, using the arts as a way in which to draw people in, to tell the stories. And it was brought to me this idea to put together a project that would be based around poetry and it would really be an interactive project that would help to tell the story. And I was so excited about it. And it was just, it was, for me, it was um, something that I had wanted to see done that would bring together not only the art and of course, bring people to the park with some visuals, um, even if they weren't in the park, but also it would be interactive. Something that would get people to get excited about how they could look at the park as a space that could inspire them because it certainly inspires me every time I'm there. And again, I have to say, if you've never been to the park, it's a great place of inspiration. If, you, if you're standing at where the orange sticks are, to the left, you can see the entire skyline of Newark. And if you look to the right, you can actually see the skyline, some of the skyline of New York City. So it's one of the few places in the city to me where it's kind of like the best of both worlds. You can see all of the beauty of um, Newark that um, comes from the vantage point of the river. So this project for me, when I thought about, oh wow, an interactive way for people to go to the park and feel inspired 
and do that through poetry, fantastic. So two of the poets that were part of that project, uh, two phenomenal poets that are from our city. I'm excited to introduce them up next. We have, I'm gonna say Paula first, ladies first, Paula Neves and Dimitri Reyes. Hey. Hello everyone, welcome. Hello everyone, welcome. And thank you Newark Museum, thank you to all the panelists and to Mohammed for setting all this up with the, you know, the scheduling and everything. I'm, I'm really honored to be here and I see a few people I recognize among the participants, so thank you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. So yeah, uh, this project, uh, when we were talking about this project, the newest Americans, we thought it was going to be a really big deal because it meant a lot to us uh, being hometown, homegrown, Newark artists, being able to give back to the community. So uh, to talk about a bit what Poem Quest is about, uh, it's a website, but it's an interactive website. So um, connected to your connected to your GPS on your phone, when you arrive to the park, if you go to poemquest.com and press play, um, and if you want, you can press play on the screen. Um, uh, different, a different page is going to pop up, and on this page, if you are in the park, so if you, you don't need to go to the I'm in the park page because you're not in the park right now, but if you were, it would GPS you and flip you to wherever you were in the park, and uh, it would signal what poem is going to pop up first because what the project was, uh, as poets, you're supposed to go to the park and interview individuals that are using the park for utility for different reasons and, and, and get inspired to write dispatches and poems off of it. Um, so what ended up happening after the poets all wrote poems, we kind of expanded the whole length of the park. So wherever you were in the park, you would get blipped to that poem and then when you were in that space, so you could be in that location, uh, the poem will play, you will see the poem on the page, and it's supposed to be an immersive experience. Mm -hmm. um, if you are elsewhere though, if you're not in the park, or if you're, if you're staying away and you're social distancing, you can go to I'm Elsewhere. So you can click on the I'm Elsewhere uh, button. So then when you click on that, what's gonna pop up, you'll see all the different polls on the sides that we did. And when you click on each, it'll reveal the location and it would, uh, you'd be able to play the poem because there's an audio recording there. Uh, Keith, maybe you could talk yeah. a bit about what it meant to you in uh, the experience and, and how well, it um, I, I think we should also give props to Newest Americans uh, and Tim mm -hmm. Raphael. So Tim Raphael is the director of Newest Americans uh, out of Rutgers University, as Marcy mentioned. And he approached us, I guess it was about two years ago, 2018, right? Yeah. Um, and he approached us and uh, talked about this project and the Riverfront Park Revival, and we were excited to be a part of it. And so, as uh, Dimitri said, uh, we were tasked with going to the park and uh, we writing poems based on interactions we had with people there. So it's, I mean, I, I've been doing this poetry thing for, you know, decades now. And I have to say going to the park to, you know, to, you know, interview people, I was really nervous about that. Um, and, and I think sometimes, even if you're very used to public speaking, I think sometimes it's good to have that experience. And um, as Marcy was saying, um, uh, because it's a public space and it's uh, it brings the community together. For me, it made me see my hometown. I'm from the Ironbound, and it made me see my my hometown section of Newark. I I also teach at Rutgers, so I've I've been in Newark my whole life. Um, it made me see the community in Riverfront Park uh, through new eyes and having to approach people. In, uh, in that way, I, I saw it differently. So, I mean, and you know, it's been a part of my life since I was a kid and I've seen a lot of the changes. I remember when, uh, you know, I remember the stack trailers. I remember uh, before uh, the, it was um, built up uh, where the apartments are now. And I, I, I mean, I remember, I've seen all the changes that have happened along the park throughout my lifetime. So, um, so sorry, Dee, I kind of went off on a tangent. What was your- No, 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 and, and, no and that's fine. But to just to piggyback off of you, like, uh, you know, I too, growing up in the North Ward, uh, which is right. really interesting to, to get the idea of the breadth of the river, this river goes all the way up into the North Ward. Right. And this is in the East Ward. So it goes from the North Ward, the Central Ward, the East Ward. So I grew up in the North. I went to school in the Central Ward, but then I played sports for East Side in the East Ward. So no matter where I was in my journey growing up, I was always by that river, mm -hmm. right? So I, I was thinking of how 
uh, as poets, we use space as survival, right? Uh, how, how we go to a space and, and we, we find solace or we find community in those spaces. Like uh, when I was in high school, that's when Riverfront started popping up as an actual park. So I got to experience the first parts of those, but I also remember when it was just sex and I remember when it was in development as like a free team. So it was really interesting to see that set up. So I was making sure that when I was writing my poems, I was getting a, a wide variety of the, of the folks that use uh, the park for different reasons. So, you know, I spoke to street organizations and, and senior citizens on park benches and the kids at the playground and then people that sit by the boardwalk during a, a, a lunchtime break. So there's so many different ways that people were using the park and, and using it a, a, as comfort. And I think it was important for this project to highlight it. So people knew how important some of these things were. Um, and, and on the underbelly of that, like Mar Maria was saying that there is this sense of like gentrification and upheaval that actually brings our people more distant to these places mm -hmm. or from these places. Uh, there's actually a concept uh, called gentrification, which is just like a subsect of gentrification. And that's the idea of taking like a black and brown culture and like extrapolating it and then using that culture in order to commodify it and make it more expensive. Like more expensive. So I think there's also a lot of conversation about how beautiful this park is, but how it's it's starting to even redline and uh, and kind of section off uh, disparate bolts within our community. And it's making our community even uh, harder to enjoy these spaces. Stay in these spaces. Uh, I wanted to make sure, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to make sure some of our stuff touched up on that too. So yeah, I, I was going to ask you because uh, um, the, of the poems that you wrote for the Poem Quest, which one uh, do you think zeroes in on those things you've been talking about the most? Um, let me see. So I would definitely say that it's not tired. It's a, and you asked me why here. I thought that one was really important uh, because that poem in particular, I, I was talking to uh, uh, one of our seniors that has been in Newark uh, since since the time of the rebellion and, and he's seen all the changes that has happened within the city and then particularly zeroing in on this park and talking about the importance and that's actually he inspired me to start thinking about the lens in terms of survival and how multi-generationally we use these parks for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, so I mean, I, I love all your poems. One, one of my favorites, it's, and it's like a poem I wish I had written, is Tire. Uh, oh, even though yeah. because that's not directly about, uh, you know, people or a person, but it's about like reflecting on the river. And like Marcy said, who also grew up uh, in the Ironbound, right? Marcy, you did say that you grew up in the Ironbound, right? Or you lived there. You yeah, lived, lived. Mm -hmm. You lived there. And for years, you didn't realize how polluted it was. No. And so, you know, I grew up in the area. I didn't realize how polluted it was. I mean, in my uh, family are, you know, Portuguese immigrants. And, you know, they're the kind of, uh, they were the kind of folks who would do something crazy, like maybe fish in the river and go eat the fish because we didn't know. I mean, not, I'm not saying that we did that, but, um, but we just didn't know. And I didn't know. And Tyre, uh, Dimitri's poem is about like reflecting on, you know, this tire that's bobbing in the river. And there's something just very soulful about that, that for me, echoes this, the importance of this river as, you know, uh, a nexus for the community. Especially on the landscape, when you're at the park and you're in the middle of nature and, it, and it's beautiful and it's bright and it's crisp and then you're looking across and, and you see all these uh, high rises and these bigger buildings, but right. then in between that, there's this river that's still polluted. And that poem in particular, I, I thought I saw some kind of animal in the water and it wasn't until it bobbed over to me that it was just more trash. And then it kind of extrapolates the idea of, ha of seeing all that other trash there. It really kind of just opened my eyes uh, to that part and kind of took me out of a, the fetishizing of the area even that we really love, the, the beautification part of it. So yeah, there's, there's still a lot of work left to be done and I'm so happy that Marcy and Maria are still doing the good work. As poets, we are going to be the bards that, that continue speaking this forward. And, and Kevin, I thank you so much for doing everything that you've been doing in terms of administration and in terms of everything you've done for the arts with the murals. Um, I, I, I didn't know that Kevin B. Sanson actually did one of those murals that inspired me while I was writing Kyrie Fuller's. And it wasn't until we met yesterday that I knew that he was also a piece of that. So uh, in Newark, you also run into a bunch of folks that are, that are feeding 
in, into your work and feeding into your inspiration all the time. And I appreciate all you. I mean, D, am I going to put you on the spot if I ask you to read one of them? Maybe, maybe if someone wants to do that in the Q and A, because I do want to get to Mr. Okay, Samson, right, and, right. I, and I kind of wanted to move on. Okay. But I think the river was a good segue to you talking about the Passaic uh, right. piece for a sec. Right. Okay. So I, I am going to read this poem. Uh, and then I think this, it, it'll be my final word because like uh, Dee pointed out, we want to leave room for Q&A. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad that uh, I'm going to get to read this because it ties in so well to what Marcia and Maria said about uh, the history of the pollution um, and also the, the threat of gentrification, which, you know, is kind of happening now. And it's something I'm concerned with as a lifelong resident of the area. And as an artist, you know, as artists, we uh, are often in, or uh, most of the time involved in the change and in, in preserving these spaces. And then as, uh, as it becomes cool and the business community moves in, and the unscrupulous business community moves in, you know, often it becomes unaffordable for folks like us and others to remain um, after all the work's been done. So I'm gonna read this poem uh, and then I think that'll be it for me. Um, it's called Passaic and it was, it appeared earlier this year in the Journal of New Jersey Poets. Um, Passaic, from the Lenape word Passaic, possibly meaning where the land splits. Well, we've heard all kinds of stories from the older generations when they were younger uh, let me just minimize it. They get to go and swim in the river. And we've never, and we've never during our lifetime ever seen that. Uh, that was uh, Sergio Rodriguez interviewed. Okay. On Monday, they may remember Sunday morning with concentric rings, ironbound antiphons in the breeze, fish hooks and faces abstracted on the green. You should have been in church, but even then you pulled yourself out to watch others haul bluefish and bass, show them glistening and struggling to strangers and kin, declaring here as if there was no other proof of being. And you, you made more of a line than anyone, treaded mud to untangle roots, mourned ducks whose bills dangled hooks, wounds blurred colors of countries you'd left, iridescent in the workday runoff, and they all said and did nothing in papers filed out of state. By Sunday evening, there's little unraveling, communion's long past bait in hand, turn of head, amen. Ribs turn back to gill in protest, livers sing the size of fists, crows go cro grow quiet on the rooftops, geese huddle on loading docks. Trees clothe themselves in dusk. A student asks, what's Agent Orange? Monday morning, late one century, they may remember how names were written on these currents. No, they'll say they invented it, subdivide and sell the waterfront. And words will write themselves again without us. Oceans rising, pray the puddles. Oceans rising, pray the lakes. Oceans rising, pray for sake. Thank you guys. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Paolo, for sharing uh, that incredible poem that really brings in all the textures and talks about all the different things that we've discussed so far. Uh, Dimitri, you know, you talked a little bit about becoming sort of disillusioned with the park when you're in there, right? Because the space is so beautiful and you can quickly forget that you are, you know, you're right on a super fun site. And it's really, really important that while we can appreciate the beauty of the park, um, and the wildlife is coming back. There is wildlife. There's not just garbage and tires there. There are, you know, you can actually find fish. There's turtles, um, some of the birds. And what I loved about that poem, Paula, is that you, you brought all of that together, all of those different elements, the, you know, the pollution that we're dealing with, the uh, abuse of the Passaic, but still recognizing the beauty there and the hope that we have that we can really turn this around because I do believe we can. It's gonna take a lot of hard work, but it's there. Thank you. Um, our next panelist that is coming up, so excited to have Kevin Blythe Sampson, who has been an important component of the art in the park. In fact, the very first art piece that was done in the park was done by and directed by Kevin. He brought together 
youth in the community along with himself and the project that we talked about, the City Murals Project that was headed by our, our dearly departed Rodney Gilbert. Uh, Kevin is a retired police officer, an artist in the city of Newark who has his works in Newark Museum and is uh, bringing together found objects really as a memorial and uh, keeping alive of the stories of those objects and of the people. So Kevin, please welcome to the panel. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your experience in really uh, designing and producing and creating that beautiful mural, the Song of the Passaic, which sits on the Seidler building uh, on Brill Street and Raymond Boulevard at just at the tip of the park. All right, here we go. Um, are you gonna put, where's the photos? Um, I'm trying to think of the year. This, well, this actually wasn't Riverfront Park. This is actually at the cut, which is by um, the Terrell um, Projects. It's underneath the bridge by Sims Meadow. Um, I can't remember if this was done first or second from the Riverfront Project, but this was done with kids from the Hawkins Street School. I was teaching, running after school programs for the Iron Valley Community Center at the Hawkins Street School at the time. So I had kids come down from all over. I had, at a certain point, I had, I don't want to call them, <clears throat> I had kids come down, kids that normally stand on the corners of Broadway and Park Ave and First Ave, they started coming down. So I had a whole group of kids that normally would be doing things that weren't too good that started participating with this first, um, with this mural. And they stayed with me. I still talked to all of them, as a matter of fact. So this was um, called The Cut, and it was done underneath the bridge. The next slide is, this is part of my, my crew. I developed on, um, and a lot of these people, well, you have Manuel, you have one of the Norks. If, if you say that Jerry Gant, who is one of my best friends in the world, is Nork, so is Manuel Acevedo. He is like the godfather of photography in Nork. He's, um, he's a gentleman. And I don't do anything without Manuel, without my son who's standing next to him, James Wilson, who's the father of skateboarding. Um, I can't see all the pictures, but these and, and the other kids are actually from um, the Hawkins Street School. Who's missing here is Cesar Melgar, who I've been working with since he was 15 years old, who is definitely one of Nork's premier artists right now. But mentioning Cesar Melgar, I'm mentioning his name for a reason. Cesar Melgar's example of what happens when you mentor a talented kid. Cesar's been exposed to Manny, who's, you know, Manny to Jerry, to Rodney, to Gladys. And all of these people together has created or helped to create this amazing young artist. Next slide. Again, this is, this is part of my, my crew that um, actually work with me. There, there were probably 10 other kids, but these are the photos of the, um, of the people that actually um, helped me. That's again, Manuel Acevedo. Manny did the whole top of the mural. And um, I don't do anything without calling up Manuel. So we talk just about every day. Next slide. This is the original drawing for um, the mural that's on the side of the Seedless building. That first mural, um, when, Rodney, when Rodney Gilbert and Ben Goldman put this program together, I got a phone call, a frantic phone call. Kevin, we need your name to put on the proposal. So I had to send him my resume and everything else. So I was, on, I was in on it from the beginning and my name was used to get the initial grant to start the City Mules program. After that, I would call Rodney and torture him probably five, six times a day. Now Rodney can handle me. So Rodney would just talk over my screaming until he won, and then we wind up laughing. I gotta mention another thing about Rodney Gilbert. The difference in Rodney Gilbert and what is being done now is that Rodney Gilbert, when he did a mural, he did that mural for the community. He made sure that the kids in the community were involved. He made sure that whatever you were learning was passed on to the next generation. Rodney Gilbert wasn't about art washing to prepare the grounds for the business community to come in and, and gentrify you and remove you. Rodney Gilbert wasn't about that. He was about the community. Next slide. 
Well, this was the, I mean, uh, you know, it's, I mean, when you're doing a public art project, it changes enormously. You, have, I had to deal with the seedlers who were somewhat religious. And so I had to take out the darkness that I normally put in, in my work. So, but, but it actually came out well, it was a fun project. But again, when I do a mural, it's always about the community. It's always about passing, passing it on. It's not a big ego trip. So I let the kids work on it. I mean, and that's what it's all about. And we need to see more of that now instead of just doing mules, you know, to, to prop up those that are coming in next to actually remove you with gentrification. We need to do, we need to involve more of our kids in these mule projects so that it can be passed on. I give credit, I worked for the Ironbrook Community Center on and off for probably 12 years. You know, from South Street School to Hawkins Street School to the Ironbrook Community Center. So I've put generations of Portuguese, Brazilian, and, and Latinx kids in, in, in this Ironbound section. Ironbound is a strange place. And it's actually starting to lose a lot of its flavor as people are buying up. You know, I have friends here who are getting phone calls every day from realtors. So you're starting to lose, you're gonna start losing the flavor of Ironbound slowly but surely. I don't even know how to fight back. I have no solutions to it. I've been screaming about gentrification for 15 years. It hasn't done a thing. But what, what I think the city of Newark is most concentrated on now is development. And they're using art as a tool to um, soften the ground, to prepare the ground for developers. And, I'm, and I don't judge any artists who are taking the murals good, it's money, take it. But at the same time, you have to realize what you're doing. Again, Rodney did murals for the community. Rodney involved the community. Rodney wanted our kids to learn. I don't see that anymore. Next one, is that it? So I guess that's basically it for me. Anything else for me? Any questions, Marcy, anything? Well, thank you so much for um, explaining the process. And you're absolutely right. You know, Rodney Gilbert um, was an incredible, incredible, he had an incredible way of bringing together the community, of really advocating for our youth and pairing up and coming youth with professional artists and bringing the community, always the community was always at the forefront. And yes. I think that this organization, Newark Riverfront Revival, has tried to model that. That has been something that's been really important to this organization is to, to keep ourselves very grounded in the community because everything that you just said and everybody that on, the, on this panel has brought up that it's, it's come up, I've taken some notes over and over and over again, is you know art makes spaces better, parks make spaces better, but who, do, who benefits from that? Is it going to be the people who actually live in those communities? Is yes, it going Lord. to be the artists that live and work in those communities? Or is it going to be other people that come in? Now, Newark certainly has room to grow. We're not uh, opposed to people coming into our community and, and helping to make our community a better place for us all. Oh. But what we do not want to happen is new people coming in while the residents get pushed out or things become so overpriced that we no longer can live in our neighborhoods. And yes. certainly what's happening in the Ironbound, uh, the landscape is changing. And by that, I mean the people that live in the Ironbound is changing. And with that, the culture changes. And that's yes. happening across the city. So what makes Newark Newark is the people. It's the flavor of the city. And that's what makes it. So I just, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the mural itself, because every time I look at that mural, I see something different. Every single time. It, it's, it's just so visually... Um, it's like a wonder every time you see a little bit element what were some of the key things that you brought into that mural that you wanted to convey that you wanted to take that artistic creation to be that real you know song of the Passaic, the story what were those elements that were important to you in creating that well i mean i had to work directly with the seedless and so i made you saw my original drawing but it had to change a lot because nook tends to want murals that have um you know a lot of history in it and so I had to change it and I had to put some elements, some historical elements into the mural, some um, historical Portuguese elements and some other things. But at the same time, I allowed the kids that came on the mural to put the ideas in. That's why you see skateboarders. There's a picture of a skateboarder, which is actually my son, James Wilson, you know? And so, but we wanted to give a nod to the industrial history of the city of New York and I mean, the mules titled the Song of the Mosaic, and, and we wanted to also give a nod to what would happen, how, 
how the riverfront itself would change because this was the starting point of that change. So we wanted to kind of show the change that was coming. And Beautiful. so again, I miss, I mean, and we had, I mean, Jerry Gant was on that mural, you know, we actually formed an organization several years ago, Jerry Gant, Manuel Acevedo, Cesar Melgar, James Wilson, and my daughter. We actually tried to form an organization that we could use to pass on what we learned to the next generation. Again, and I can't, and as a grandfather of a of a young of a of a young girl who is um half Cuban, my advice to you Latinx to the Latinx community is fight harder. You're really neglected in the city of Newark. You don't have enough of a voice here. I've seen it for years. I've yelled about it for years. You know, in my day there wasn't enough of y'all here, but there is now. So fight back. Get more of a represent um, representation in the city of Newark, because Newark tends to be Afrocentric and they tend to forget about you. So fight. I guess I'm always advocating fighting something, but still. Listen, you know, the fight, 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 fight back. The fight never ends. I think it's important that we continue to fight for all the things that uh, help to keep, you know, equity in the community. I think that's really important and that's across the board. I have one just one other question about that mural. The closest thing to heaven on earth is what it says there. Where did that come from? I think that's part of it. There was a song that was written. That was actually given to me by the seedlers. And they actually wanted that line put into um into the mural itself. They were a lovely couple. Yeah. You know what I mean? They were very, very supportive of the community. I mean, that place there, the seedlers supported the community. And so it was kind of fitting that they would be the first ones to put up the money you know, for this mural. But those early days of the mural was a trip. I mean, you know, I'm telling you, I would go around here three times a day, these paintbrushes suck. You're picking out the wrong paint. You know what I mean? I tortured them, but we were such good friends that we, we could do that, you know. Great, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, this shout out to the Sidlers. They've been huge uh, support of Riverfront Park and they've um, funded a lot of things in our community and uh, of course allowing us to use it. They've since sold uh, Sidler Chemical, Com Chemical Company, but they're still a part of the organization Friends of Riverfront Park. Um, thank you, Kevin. I had just one question that I wanted to pose to our poets um, with Poem Quest. You talked a little bit about the soul of the river and indeed I know when I'm in the park, I'm a nature person, you know, it speaks to me. And I just wanted to, I know that a lot of what it said to you was in the poems that you created, but it wasn't just about that. It was about the people that you encountered along the way. But if there was something that that river spoke to you, I just wanted to ask if there's something, something that you wanted to share that you got out of those moments that you spent in the river that maybe you didn't put into your poetry that you could share with us today about that soul of the river and what it means to the city and to the community. Um, for me, it, it some of the best memories I have of time spent with my family and just I mean, the history of my family uh, in this area, and I, it's tied into their immigration here and also my own history. I, I mean, the most memorable moments from my life, we've spent along that river in one of those parks, whether it was, you know, um, you know, driving over it. Uh, it, it was before, you know, uh, it was before it, there was actually a park the way we know it now there, but driving over it or, you know, up in Lyndhurst, the, the Passaic goes up, you know, to Lyndhurst too, spending time up there. I mean, the soul of the river for me is, is tied so much to family and community. Um, uh, I think for me, it's the idea of memory, right? Uh, there, there's, this, there's this idea and there's this belief that water holds memory and water, water can hold a certain vibrational energy, right? And you know, that, that, that water has just been there looking at our history, looking at our current history of what's going on today. So when, when I think of the river, I, I think of movement and I just think of dense, dense memories, nostalgia, and just importance of, you know, and this is the poet talking, there's the writer talking, just making sure that we are highlighting those stories highlighting the Latinx community that is even in our language, highlighting our, our Black community that has always been there but still needs to be represented, and highlighting uh, our immigrant community that's passing. Um, I think these stories are all very, very important. Uh, when, when, you think of, when you think of personal writings and you think of poetry and, and you're trying to do a social sciences paper, those are primary sources. They're primary sources for a reason. 
because they're the direct link to, they're the pulse to the history. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maria, I have a question for you. Um, so much of what ICC does is really a collaborative effort. It's not just about the hard work. And I know because I work with you all, this is work that doesn't stop. This is not a nine to five job. This is work that uh, is ongoing. The, the community is also really important. The artists are important. What um, can people do, right? We want, what can people do? How can people get involved and be a part, use their artistic talents? How can people that are maybe not artists, but um, that are learning about some of these issues for the first time, um, what can people do? How can they get involved and in, in, in what ways can help people help to push forward the changes that need to happen? Because one thing that I hope people take away from this conversation is how important your voice truly is how important lending your artistic talents to these issues is, and most importantly, that this is not over. This cleanup that needs to happen, the environmental pressures that are in our city that are affecting every single one of us. And if you don't know that, you need to know because you need to be protecting yourself in the best way that you can. What can people do? How can they be a part of that change? Yeah, no, that's super important because as artists, artists lend their voice in, in, in the form of, of their work. But I think it's always important for all of us to remember is that our lived experience, you know, is our expertise, it's our work, and we have a responsibility to share our lived experience, to share it to our elected officials. And that's just, I think when people hear elected officials, they just think like city hall, but it's like, Going to zoning board and planning board, that's something I didn't know about, but there's decisions that get made about our neighborhoods in these places. And, you know, they're like Mondays and Thursdays and they, you can fight back when you see these high rises coming up. It's not a secret decision that gets made. There's a public process to a lot of things. Um, so I would encourage folks and you can always plug in with Ironbound Community Corporation because that's something we do, right? Like we, we try to get as many community members to these meetings so that we can um, gain some community control. And, you know, I think it's important, like we have agency as community members and when we show up together, we can win. You know, like we won River Front Park. Actually, um, just this week, we won an environmental justice bill that took 12 years, you know? So that environmental justice bill actually says no more, you know, like you look in the city of Newark, you think about our incinerator, our sewage treatment plant, you know, things that are burning, uh, we we'll burn the trash of New York City, you know, like that's crazy to me in Newark, we shouldn't have to breathe in the trash of New York City, but yeah, we're breathing it, we're breathing it in. And the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protections had no way to say no. And now after 12 years of the communities, all over New Jersey who are like ours fighting, we have a law that does that. But these fights take time and you have to participate. You know, you have to participate. If you're not participating, you can't be like a at-home philosopher criticizing everybody else because you got no skin in the game, you know? So I say, get in, let's get messy together and let's take power back for our communities. Beautiful, thank you, Maria. Um, Mohammed, I know that there's some questions that have come in on Facebook. Yes. So we have one question from France Garrido. I hope I pronounced your name properly. Um, the question is, how has the Passaic River been adversely affected by Agent Orange? That's, that's a, I guess that's a question that anyone can answer. So I'll open it to you guys. Uh, well, I'll, I'll defer to, to Maria for the, the real expertise on it, but I, can, <laughs> but I can definitely tell you that how it's been affected is by dioxin. I mean, dioxin is one of the most harmful chemicals known to humans. It was used, if you're not familiar, you might not be old enough to remember the Vietnam War, but it was used in the Vietnam War as a chemical weapon. It's a defoliant. It's, it was used, it was dropped into the jungles in Vietnam to uh, kill all of the plants that were there so that they could find the, the Viet Cong and attack. And um, it's a war tool and it was created in our community and it was dumped into the Passaic. They say that if you've had any contact with dioxin that you're guaranteed to have cancer at some point in your life. So Maria, if, if you could just um, yeah. just talk a little more on that, please. And it's in the sediment, right? So like that mud at the bottom of the river, it's there. And so you have like the castration. This is where we really go back to like science in elementary school, like the cycle of life. 
the crustaceans eat it and a bit of fish eats it, a bigger fish, maybe the crabs. I know a lot of folks still, we, we did a study with NYU, there's still folks fishing and eating out of that river. And unfortunately you can't do that. You know, and now that we have so many Latin American immigrants who, and I'll say it because right for my family too, if you see a river, you're like, oh, perfect. I can fish and I can eat. <laughs> should be that should be the way of life we should be in right relationship but we're not um and that wasn't us right that was like the colonizers ancestors who did that to our river but um we can help heal that because it's not just agent orange on the river too i want to be clear about that i encourage you to join the community advisory group for the Passaic river um you know you can uh, talk to marcy talk to myself but you can be an active participant in making sure that we clean up the river because it's not just agent orange there's fertilizer in there from upstream from the far farms uh, you know in more upstate new jersey there's a ton of other pollution in there and it affects it by the fish by killing it um by killing the oxygen in the river there's just a ton of impacts and we can't swim in it because we also have sewer overflow so that's the backup when you're flushing and it's been raining that's going straight into the river after 10 minutes because our sewage treatment plant can't handle it so we all have a responsibility to help heal the river, heal ourselves. Thank you, Maria. Um, we have uh, two more questions from our Q&A tab. Janet Cashin asks, where is the large mural located and when was it created? I'll direct that to you, Kevin. <laughs> Maybe you want to direct that to Marcy. I barely know where I'm at. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Kevin, you are such a true artist. I well, love it. It's on what? Raymond Boulevard and what's that? Not Brill Street. What is yeah, that? you got it. Brill Street. Oh, wow. Look at that. So yeah. Raymond Boulevard and Brill Street across from 7-Eleven. Is that 7-Eleven still there? Quick check. Mm -hmm. It's closed, but yeah, it's right across from there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you got it. That's right on the that's on the far portion of the park where the sports fields are located. If you don't know where Brill Street is, it's uh, going east. So right before you get onto the one and nine, it's really deep um, right next to Terrell Homes. So it's Brill Street for those. And I also just wanted to note, thank you, Lewis Kleiman, for your comments. Uh, Lewis is a, a great friend to the Passaic River. He um, made a comment in the chat that uh, talked about the Passaic River Superfund Community Action Group, which Maria also touched on. But I just want to give people that resource. The website is ourpassaic.org forward slash C-A-G. And thank I want to you. thank Cynthia Mellon, who's one yes. of my best friends. She she has taught me about the environment over the years. I guess I've known her 20 years and we hang out. But Cynthia mm -hmm. is who I call when I want to know anything about the environment. Thank you for bringing up Cynthia because I think she's representative of so many people in the community that have been working on this for decades. This is there are so many people out there that are working. I mean, we could sit here all day and shout out people that are working on this because there are a ton of people and a lot of them are nameless and a lot of them are working tireless without any recognition whatsoever. So thank you for shouting out Cynthia. Was there one more question, Mohammed? Uh, yes, we have one more from Joanne Daywalt and I'm assuming this would be directed towards Paula and Dimitri. Uh, she asks, is it true that this is the first super super fun site? I'm assuming she's talking about um, the uh, riverfront you guys were talk talking about early earlier. She's talking about the environmental pollution. Uh, Maria, you had mentioned that it was the first, is it the first super fun site in the country or is it the, the longest? The longest, not the yeah. first though. Okay. So I, I don't know, I've never heard that one. Um, <laughs> it is, yes. It's 17 miles of a super fun site. 17 um, miles. Yeah, and one thing that um, I just wanted to touch on really quickly the, for the person who asked the question about the Agent Orange is that there was also a fire at the Dalman Alkali Company. So it wasn't just that there was this stuff being dumped into the river. There was this massive fire, it was in the 80s. And that soot spread around the entire Ironbound and the South Ward. And we do these boat tours where we go through all of this, you know, we give all the information of everything that's happening along the river. So it's, as Maria mentioned, there's a ton of pollution that's there, not to mention the Passaic Valley Sewage Commission, which is a sewage, sewage treatment plant. There's an incinerator, the Covanta incinerator. These companies burn over, I think it's 1.2 million households worth of garbage on a daily basis. There are not 1.2 million houses in Newark. 
Um, a lot of this stuff is coming from Brooklyn. A lot of it comes from New York cities. If you live in the area, you can hear the trucks, the garbage trucks coming at night. Most of them are New York city garbage trucks, which adds to the pollution in the city because of the emissions from the trucks. The Passaic Valley Sewage Commission is the same thing. They're processing sludge of over a million households per day. So those are the environmental pressures that are there, but this fire that happened spread that dioxin around in different kinds of ways. So it's not just on the river. So I urge people that if you live in the area and you want to plant in your backyard, please test your soil because your soil is pretty likely to be contaminated, not just with dioxin, but that's one of the things. And it's really important that uh, if you are gonna plant, that you have raised beds, and that if you want to plant directly into your soil, that you do test it. Thank you. I also wanna make one more mention uh, because Paula was very modest in not mentioning that her poem was the 2020 New Jersey Poets Prize. So congratulations, Paula, that you took uh, the element of the Passaic and you brought it to New Jersey at large. Congratulations. Now, I didn't see if we had any other questions in the chat. Did we have any other questions in the chat? No. We have no more questions. Okay, yeah, Cl uh, Lewis mentioned that the Love Canal, I thought that was the, the first super fun site that's in upstate New York. Um, but it's important, especially I think nowadays with the, the current administration, you know, every single day where it seems as though we're hearing another rollback on the environmental protections that, that we have in place. And uh, this is why, as Maria mentioned, that engagement is so important. Know who your representatives are, get involved in your local politics and your local, um, look at the local organizations that are on the ground that are being a part of this and, you know, lend your voice, uh, spread the word. If at the very least, if there's nothing else that you can do, tell this story to somebody else so that, you know, with that, we can be more educated and aware and start to think about how uh, we can come up with some solutions. Um, for some closing remarks, remarks, Maria, I want to bring it back to you because one thing that we've discussed in this come up throughout this entire conversation is, is how art is used um, and, and to make spaces better and, and gentrification is, is a real thing. Uh, so often, you know, we're finding that as we talked about earlier, we're beautifying our neighborhoods, we're bringing value and then we're pushed out. So this is an ongoing thing. So I want to turn it over to you for final remarks and uh, just so that we can leave um, with, with something really strong to take away with us. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Moving forward, what do we do? <laughs> yeah, what do we do? No, what do we do? Well, you know, all change happens bottom up, right? But it, it only happens with us like waking up that we, we can take responsibility for our communities. It's not just in the hands of some outsider, someone else. You know, I really encourage everyone to learn the fight of Riverbank because they, they lost at every conceivable turn they lost and they didn't give up. You know, Nancy Sack always tells us in the office, we just can't all give up at the same time. And I think right now <laughs> in the times that we're living in, it's really easy to feel like that's it, I'm done, you know, but surround yourself with community so that then you can take turns giving up because I, you know, we get exhausted. Um, but when we're in community, we can lean on each other and realize that this system is trying to kill us in every which way, whether that be through police brutality, immigration raids, you know, it, it pollutes the water we drink, the air we breathe, and it tries to, uh, keep healthy food away, but we can take control back and we can fight together so that, that when we beautify things, we can keep them. Cause I do think we deserve nice things. <laughs> um, but we, when we get nice things, we need to fight to keep our nice things. Cause there's always, you know, <laughs> the colonizers trying to take it away from us, but we have to fight and we have to fight together and well, we have to rest, right? But we can only do that if we're in community. Like, there's no lone soldiers. I love what Kevin said about not making this about ego. There's no one person that wins any goddamn fight. You know, I saw a lot of people shouting out Damon Rich. I'm happy for his work, but it wasn't just him. It was the community, you know, and we can never forget that. None of us are self-made people. That that's a, that's a capitalist myth. You know, we have to rely on each other and we have to rely on community. So let's keep in the struggle together, right? Thank you, Maria. 
you, you ended us on the high note that we needed to end on. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning into this panel today. To our panelists, Kevin Blight Sampson, Maria Lopez Nunez, Dimitri Reyes, Paula Nevj, and Mohammed. Thank you for hosting us today. We have Megan behind the scenes. Shout out to you and the whole staff at Newark Museum for making this happen. Please visit all of uh, our sites, newarkriverfront.org. You can follow us on social media. Come on down to the park. Be a part of this change that is happening. It's continuing. We have a new section that will be opening up uh, soon, hopefully by the fall. Um, check out poemquest.com. It's poemquest.com, right? It's not org. poemquest.com. Visit the Ironbound Community Corp website, uh, ironboundcc.org to find out about the work that's being put into our communities, get involved, volunteer, and check out Kevin's work. You could check out his work in the Newark Museum. You can go down and see the Song of the Passaic. You can see that mural that's on the underpass there in the cut in the Ironbounds. And uh, please stay involved, folks. We, we really need you. As Maria said, this is a collaborative effort. If COVID has taught us anything, it's how connected we really are. So people, please love one another, stay safe, stay well, get involved, and really don't forget that you do have the power. The power rests with the people and the arts is one of those things that continues to highlight our stories, to tell our stories and to show us the very power that we have. So thank you everybody for tuning in today. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Newark Museum. Uh, I just wanted to add before we go, you guys can be sure to check out our website for next week museum's crawl. Art Olympics, it'll be September 2nd. And if you haven't already, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, as well as our wonderful panelists. Goodbye. Thanks for wa watching, guys. Uh,